I think we're ready to go. Without any further ado, the one, the only, it's Alice Cooper! You're worthy. <laughs> How many like panels start like that with people chanting we're not worthy? Well, uh, I probably get we're not worthy 20 times a day. Yeah. Mostly in airports. And everybody thinks it's the first time I've ever seen it. <laughs> and I, I try to go, oh, clever. I've never seen that before. Well, then you're a good actor. Well, <laughs> how has your weekend been here so far? It's been great. Great. I try to do uh, cities that I've never done before. So, you know, being here is great. And uh, we're actually going to play here on October 8th. Right, so, I just heard that. So if you've never seen the Alice Cooper show in full, you want to see it because it's disturbing. <laughs> but most importantly, how's the golf here? You know, uh, I, when I, w I just got done with playing Europe with uh, the vampires, with the Hollywood vampires. And Johnny Depp does not play golf. Joe Perry does not play golf. So I, I didn't play at all while I was in Europe. But I usually, in, I live in Arizona, so I play every day there. Except it's 123 degrees there right now, so. <laughs> so you're in the better place, right here in Raleigh. Yeah, I should stay here, but I, I've got to go home tonight. Understandable. So one of the things we were just talking about backstage, obviously, I'm sure most people here have seen one of your live shows, and if they haven't, definitely come check it out. But I had the opportunity to be your balloon girl. And when you're up in the stage, obviously you have your props, you have your sword, and you had mentioned to me that most people in your band have had stitches. Yes. Uh, if you get in my band, I, I always guarantee you that you're going to get paid, you're going to see the world, and you're going to get stitches. Because if you get too close to the sword, uh, and I always have knives and swords on stage, and they're not rubber. They're real. So everybody will get maybe a little too close and just get a little nick on the side of their... And they, they get very excited about, the, I get to get my stitches now. <laughs> so everybody gets stitches. It's like the code of honor. Yeah. And the sword, by the way, is Errol Flynn's sword. Yeah, so I use Errol Flynn's sword on stage. That's so awesome. Yeah. Have you ever had an encounter with the guillotine that was maybe like a little scary? Uh, with, the, with what? The with, with your guillotine, yeah. The, you know, the props, anytime you're using props on stage, you set yourself up for spinal tap moments. You know, things that should work, but just don't. And sometimes the things that don't work are the things you keep in the show because they, you know... Um, one time in England, we did the, the gallows. Now, when we were first starting out, what happens, I can reveal how the gallows works because it's, it's, you know, it's not a brain teaser. There's a wire that comes down the back that hooks onto the back of your uh, vest and, and you, nobody sees the vest underneath your... Uh, it's just like, you know. And it stops you an inch from the actual rope. Well, we, it's a piano wire, but we, we had used it a hundred times, didn't, not realizing that they lose their elasticity after a while. And we're in London, and the floor drops out, and all of a sudden I felt the rope here. And I went, and I just automatically went back like that, and it burned my throat pretty good, but it didn't catch me, right? Uh, but immediately I said, could we make that like a, a little stronger, that... <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, it every time the floor drops out or every time the guillotine blade comes down, the guillotine only misses me by this much. And it's a 40-pound blade. It's a real blade. So don't try this at home, by the way, <laughs> if you have guillotines at home. And I'm sure everybody does. Uh, it, I always like to keep something in the show that is... You know when you go to the circus and you see the guy in the cage with the tiger and all he's got is a chair and a whip? Well, the tiger could easily take the chair out of his hand. And you always have that moment of going, wow, that could really happen. The guy could actually really get it. I want that element in the show that if I didn't do it right, it actually could cut my head off. So that's, that, that's part of the element in the show that, that makes it really exciting, I think, for the audience. Sure. Whew. How does your wife feel about all that? You know, it, it's, I make sure I don't argue with anybody Especially the people running the guillotine before the <laughs> They're the highest paid people on the whole thing. Uh, no, she, she understands I've done it thousands of times, you know. Uh, my wife plays, um, she plays the nurse in the show, and she plays the rag doll that does Only Women Bleed. And we've been married 42 years. 
And she, is, uh, she was 18 when she joined the Nightmare Show. Welcome to my nightmare. And, uh, and so we started having kids and everything and, and ended up, well, my oldest daughter took her place for 12 years, Calico did. And then when the kids all grew up and had their own kids, she came back in the show. And now she's the scariest thing in the show. She's amazing. She's much more frightening than me, but <laughs> the best looking thing in the show too. Awesome. Yeah, it's true, she's beautiful. <laughs> Um, what would you say is the craziest rumor that you've ever heard about yourself? Okay, I wasn't, uh, let me see. I wasn't Captain Kangaroo's son. Is that a thing? No. Um, I was not Eddie Haskell on Leave it to Beaver. I wish I was Eddie Haskell right. for me. That, that, what happened was during an inter early interview, I said, they said, what were you like as a kid? I said, I was a regular Eddie Haskell. And then that got that I was Eddie Haskell. So we're rehearsing one day, and this L.A. highway patrol guy came in, takes off his helmet, and it's Eddie Haskell. It's Kenny Osmond. And he looked exactly like Eddie Haskell. And he says, so I understand, and I, we had a big laugh about it. It, ha it just so happens that, that Ken Osmond, Eddie Haskell, was wounded four times saving a lady from being, uh, I think, raped or something. He took four bullets and was like a, uh, a hero. He was a retired a hero. So, thumbs up on Eddie Haskell. So at this time, if it's all right with you, we're gonna open it up for some audience questions, if sure. that's okay. No math, okay? <laughs> no math, no science, no I politics. Don't do math. Any of that craziness. So, uh, if you guys don't mind, before you ask your question, maybe just say your name, and like I said before, one question per person. And there is an echo in here, so speak plainly. Hello, my name's Mike. It's nice to meet you, Alice. Uh, on the Hey Stupid album, um, you had a lot of guest artists in there. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne, uh, I think Slash, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Satriani, uh, Steve Vai, and all the McMars. Uh, was it difficult getting all of them together, like to record that over the course of recording the album? Or it, uh... it was a phone call. You know, it was it was kind of fun because one thing about rock artists is that we're all kind of a fraternity. You know, and if if Satriani called me up to do something, I mean, Axl Rose called me at two in the morning. You know, he says, "Can you do this song with me?" Uh, you know, uh, the Garden, I think it was on. And I went, sure. I came over and I, I said, but it's not going to take two weeks to do, right? <laughs> so I did like four takes of it and it was done. But we, we all play on each other's albums, you know, and it's, to me, that's kind of the cool thing about being in a fraternity. Everybody can work on everybody's stuff. Thank you very much, Alice. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Elvira was also on that. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Great, what song? She was on, uh, no, oh, let me think. Uh, she was on, I think she was on Hey Stupid. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, Alice, how you doing? Good. It's Brandon. How did the Wayne's World role come about? Did you know Lauren previous to this? Or did you get you know, with a meeting? <laughs> you know, I had seen the skit on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And they were looking for somebody that was sort of on the level that had been in the business long enough to be legendary. <laughs> and they asked me to do it. And they only told me I was going to do the song, Feed My Frankenstein. I went, okay, great. When I got there... Mike says, well, you're an actor. And he says, uh, can you do a couple of lines? And I went, sure. You know, and he has me about eight pages of dialogue. <laughs> and I went, when are we shooting this? And he goes, about 20 minutes. So half of the stuff that I was saying, I was riffing on. You know, I, I, I said it probably 25 times different ways, you know. But I had Dana here and Michael there. And when they're doing the we're not worthy thing, they're doing everything they can to make me laugh. And I'm, I found a point between them that I get, delivered all my lines to, so I, I, I only saw them sort of in side reel vision. But if you would actually hear the outtakes to We're Not Worthy, it's so vile. <laughs> it goes on for 10 minutes, and it just gets getting worse and worse and worse. I don't know who has those outtakes, but it may ruin some careers if it ever got out. <laughs> Thank you, Al. See you in October. Hi, Alice. My name's Jill. Um, everybody always asks you about your time on The Muppet Show. Yeah. But I know of several other shows that I've actually seen you on that I've never heard you talk about. I've seen you on The Soupy Sales Show. Yes. 
you have, I've seen you on a YouTube doing the Alphabet show. Yes. I think out of London. Yeah. And the Virginia Graham show. Yes. Well, first of all, the Soupy Sales show was something I couldn't wait to do. Because when I was a kid, I grew up in Detroit. And Soupy started in Detroit. And you would come home from lunch, for, from school, and have lunch with Soupy. You know, and he had all the same characters, Pookie and White Fang and Black Tooth and all that. And when he said, do you want to do the show? I went, yeah. And I said, who was on last week? And he says, well, we had Frank Sinatra on last week. And he got hit with a pie. And I went, well, he said, the funniest thing about getting hit with a pie is you can't let anybody know it's coming. You can't react like, you can't do that. It's only funny if it hits you and you don't react and, you know, you don't flinch. So that was the hardest part of the whole thing, was not flinching, but I, I didn't flinch. And I got hit square with it. I mean, it was, it, it, I watched it just the other day and it was really funny. I, I, see, I saw it recently too. And, I have, like, I, and Soupy, Soupy was great. You know, was, he was really, really good. And his two sons actually played with Bowie, the sales brothers. Played with uh, David Bowie for a while in Tin Machine. Thank you. Great. Hey, my name is Mike. Um, Thank you for rocking my socks off. Summer 2012, opening up for Iron Maiden yes. in Charlotte. I was sick. Um, I've heard a lot of interviews when it comes to you knowing Jim Morrison. Yeah. And I hear so many different views of how he was as a person. Well, he was a good person, but you know, alcohol made him awful. What's your take on him? He, he was really a unique guy because he was truly an artist. He was truly a poet. And he looked like the statue of David, so every girl loved him, you know. But, you know, he would take pills the way that you would eat Skittles, you know. And that was a very self-destructive character. But I got along really well with him. One, one night we were, uh, or one afternoon we were in the studio. And I was sitting there, and he's writing lyrics for a song. And he says, so what's going on? I said, I don't know. I got up this morning, got myself a beer, and he writes it down. The next thing you know, it's in the song. <laughs> so when you hear that line, that's my line. Okay. <laughs> but he was great. He was really, really, yeah, I had a great time with him. Uh, Robbie Krager said one time we, were, we opened for them in Oregon, and we, a theater in Oregon. And Robbie said he came walking in, and we were both hanging from the balcony, trying to see who would hang on the longest. Right? It was a pretty good drop. And he told me this story, and I went, I don't remember that. <laughs> and he says, well, you wouldn't. You guys were so drunk. <laughs> it was <laughs> Anyways, it was, yeah, I had, a lot of, I had a good time with Jim. Jim was great. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Are you getting residuals for your one line that you got to write for him? What's that? I said, are you getting residuals no, for the I line? Know, no, oh, I, 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 you know, I didn't even tell Robbie Krager that until later on <laughs> that that was my line. Someone's on the house. What's your name? Uh, Gary, uh, and hello, Maurice Escargot. Good to see you. <laughs> um, I, I've always wondered this. At your funeral, if you were going to have three songs played, what would they be and why? Huh, that's pretty good. Um, I never really thought of that since I'm never going to die. Uh, <laughs> I die. <laughs> I die every night on stage, so now it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you got gonged once. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, they'd probably all three be hymns trying to pad my bet, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't try to get so, so clever that I would try to, to, to out-clever God on that. So I would, I'd pick three good hymns, you know. Yeah. Three good hymns? Yeah. Okay, I'd great. find three good ones. Great. Look forward yeah. to seeing you in October. Okay, God thank bless. you. Um, hello. Hi. Um, my name's Haley. I saw you back in 2013 with my mom, and I was wondering, you probably heard this many times, but what's your first, what was your favorite performance? My favorite performance? Okay, I'll tell you the weirdest performance, okay? Um, we played the very first concert ever in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The very first rock concert ever. Indoors, the place was about eight times bigger than Madison Square Garden. Picture that. We had 158,000 people indoors. Now, if you take that many Brazilians and they just clap their hands once, it would be deafening. 
So figure 158,000 Brazilians stoned and drunk at the top of their lungs, oh. screaming. And the funny thing was, is anybody under the equator, 80% of the people under the equator believe in Macumba, which is a combination of Catholicism and voodoo and all this other stuff. So if you remember what I looked like back then, I had the makeup on, I had the snake and everything like this. And the paper the next day, there was a full page picture of me, right? And it just said, Macumba. <laughs> you know. So I'd walk down the street and people would... It was kind of a powerful feeling. It was wonderful. But I mean, uh, yeah, it was the weirdest. There was a, um, a wall of amps the size of from here to there. I couldn't hear one note. And the guys were playing as loud as they could. And I couldn't hear it because of the audience was that loud. But it's still a Guinness Book of Records. Biggest indoor cr crowd of all time. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Macumba. I like that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah. Hi. I was wondering if there's a, an an underrated song you have in your catalog that maybe you wish was more popular so you could play it, one that would be fun to play more? You know, it's so funny. I, there are so, certain songs, and every artist has these, that you're absolutely sure is a hit record, and it's not. And uh, there was a song called um, Lost in America that I thought was an absolute... It, right now, it fits everything that's going on right now. Maybe we should re-release it now. We should. Um, <laughs> There was another song uh, called Love's a Loaded Gun, which I thought was a hit single, and it wasn't. And then there were other songs that were hits that I never thought they would be hits. So you, you never really can predict it. The only song I knew was going to be a hit was School's Out. If, if that wasn't a hit, I was going to go sell shoes somewhere, you know. Because I said, if that's not a hit, then I'm insane. It, it was a hit. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Coop. Hi. My name is Austin. Uh, thanks for being here. First off, my Thank wife you. and I drove here four hours to see you and, oh. and Steve Whitmire, of course. Um, <laughs> Just want to thank you that you're still putting out so much, such great original material at this point of your career. Uh, Hollywood Vampires, the new album Paranormal. And speaking of which, on Paranormal, my favorite song, uh, Dynamite Road, it sounds like there's a callback riff to the Black Widow from Welcome to My Nightmare. I don't know if I'm imagining that or not, but is that true? And if so, what was the... Uh, I know you like to kind of call back to, like, with Welcome to My Nightmare and everything yeah. you like to call back. What was the point with that song? That happens a lot with writers. Uh, you know, you'll be writing something and you'll refer to another song. Or you'll, you'll be influenced by your own song that maybe was on eight albums ago. And it's something I don't think you can do. I think Bob Dylan does that a lot. You, you hear a Bob Dylan song and, you, and it reminds you of another Bob Dylan song, which reminds you of another Bob Dylan song. You know, uh, that does happen. That's sort of the rockabilly song on that album, mm -hmm. you know. And, and songs like that, was, especially that song, I wanted it to be sort of Devil Comes Down to Georgia, you know, thing. But the, whole, the funny thing about it was the fact that he cared more about his car than his band. Yeah. You know, that was the punchline of that thing. You know, I can, see why, I can see why the devil killed the band, but did he have yep. to wreck that car? Yep. That was I my know. favorite car. <laughs> yeah, poor thing. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's always fun to write with Bob Ezrin because he has the same sense of humor as I do. It's a, kind of a dark sense of humor. And uh, we, you try to write your punchline first and then work backwards. Yeah, we'll write the song around it. Yeah. I don't know if it was a continuation of like the Steven storyline or something that was kind of hidden in there that you know, astute listeners might find. Or well, something. let me explain Steven. I, just, I think I finally figured Steven out. You know, I, I, he, this character keeps showing up in every, you know. Um, and I realized Steven is probably the seven-year-old little boy that lives in all of us. And I never wanted to get rid of that little boy. Because yeah. that, uh, that's, that what, that's what makes us jump on a skateboard once in a while. That's what makes us want a fast car. That's what makes us watch Godzilla movies. Chop your head off every night. Uh, yeah, honestly. My show is, is very much a seven-year-old dream. And I, I kind of I think that that's who Steven is, is, yeah. is that little impish kid. Cool. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Hey, Alice. Hi. Lifelong fan. Uh, my son's a huge fan, and it's all my fault. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, Raise Your Fist and Yell is like one of my favorite albums from you. Um, can you tell me what the uh, inspiration behind that might have been? Well, it was when I came back after my alcoholism. I, I, you know, I decided to come back, and the last four songs before the alcoholism thing happened were all ballads because the disco plague had happened. 
in, uh, in rock and roll, and they would only play disco. And, they, and for Kiss, they would only play Beth. For Aerosmith, they would only play the, you know, all these power ballads. And I had four of them in a row. And I thought the audience might think I was going soft. And it really wasn't, wasn't that at all. They just, every album had a, a ballad on it, and that was the only thing they'd play on the radio was the ballad. So when I said, when we come back, I need to come back really hard. I think it said on the album, featuring no ballads. <laughs> and Kane Roberts was, was my co-writer on that. And if you've ever seen Kane Roberts, Kane Roberts had Stallone's body and Jerry Lewis's brain. <laughs> so he was the funniest person I'd ever worked with, but he looked amazing on stage. I mean, yeah. he, he had this guitar that shot fire out of it, you know, like a flamethrower. And he's still one of the most bizarre characters I've ever worked with. But we wrote all those songs based on splatter movies. And uh, that, splatter movies had just come in and we'd sit and watch them all day and they'd just start writing songs, you know. And, and Constrictor and Raise Your Fist and Yell was totally based on splatter movies. Cool. Thanks. Hi, my name is Kendra. Hi. And I just wanted to know how it was playing King Herod on the live Jesus Christ Superstar this April. Well, you know, they, I, I had done Herod uh, on the uh, album, on the... Uh, Tim Rice, I've known Tim Rice for a long time. And he said, we're going to re-record the original cast album, but we want you to do Herod. Because I want it to be a little bit more dangerous. Mm -hmm. I want it to have a little bit more venom in it. And so I, I did it for the album a long time ago, 16, 17, 20 years ago, something like that. When this came along, and they decided to do this play, a one-time only, live on TV... They decided to do it like a rock concert. Mm -hmm. And so they asked me if I'd play Herod, and I went, yeah, sure, I could play that character. Now, if you've ever seen the Herod character, he's always usually a roly-poly kind of idiot, yeah. you know? <laughs> and I saw him as sort of an Alan Rickman, you know, kind of condescending, you know, oh, you know. When he walks out and the audience is all cheering and they're like this, he thinks it's for him. He doesn't even notice Jesus there because he's so egotistical. He thinks the whole thing's about him. So I played it that way, you know, that, that I could walk around. Then I noticed Jesus. Oh, like, who are you? <laughs> and I think that nobody had ever played it like that before. Uh, I just played him like, like Alan Rickman would have played him. Mm -hmm. You were definitely the best King Herod out of every mm -hmm. single oh, movie Oh, thank you. Seen. Thank you. It was fun. I hope you have a great day. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah, I loved your take on him as well. If you could be in another musical, is there another one you would like to be in? Oh, yeah, I should. Uh, uh, West Side Story. Yeah. I would definitely, I would be Bernardo. I'd be Bernardo. You know they're remaking that currently, I believe. Yeah, they are. Okay, uh, we'll have to make some phone calls. I think calls. Spielberg is doing it. Yes, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, you've got to be able to dance and do all that stuff. But I've always said that, that was a fantasy of mine, is playing Nardo, you know. How's it going, Alice? Good. Um, I'm a huge fan of rock and metal, and I'm, you know, relatively young and hopeful for the future. So I want to know, as a venerable person in that field, what are some modern acts that you feel are, are good and are worthy of carrying that torch? Well, you know, there's the thing about... I'm going to go off on a tirade here because it's, it's a, f a favorite thing of mine right now, <laughs> is young bands right now are so anemic, I cannot believe it. They're, they have no teeth at all. They're afraid to be rock stars. You know, they say, you, get a, you get a 16, 17, 18-year-old band, and they're introverted. And they're singing, oh, oil is bad, and the environment is awful. Uh, uh. I want to hear about your girlfriend. That's what a rock song is about, you know. When, when we came up, we wanted to be Mick Jagger. We didn't want to be some little introvert. You wanted to be flamboyant. You wanted to be something bigger than life. And I don't understand why it's introverted now rather than extroverted. Be an extrovert. The audience wants you to be bigger than life. They want you to be something that's not real. You know, if I, I, I see young bands all the time and I say, don't tune up in front of the audience. That makes you human. I said, they don't want you to be human. They want you to be something other than they are. So don't relate to them. And that's so hard for people to understand. They go, they go yeah, but I want to relate with the audience. I go, no, you don't. <laughs> you, you want to not relate with the audience. When people look at Alice, they don't go, oh, I identify with him. 
I hope not. Because <laughs> Alice doesn't even talk to the audience. He's, he doesn't, you know, it, the character, the Alice is, is not, I don't know where he's from, but he's certainly not human and he's certainly not one of them, you know. Uh, and the funny thing is when I play with the vampires, we're the world's most expensive bar band. You know, we just play, if somebody yells out brown sugar, we play that. I talk to the audience all night because I'm not playing Alice. But when I play Alice, I never ever talk to the audience. And I look at, I look at them and kind of like they were, you know, uh, he's Mask. almost alien, you know. And I think Bowie played that, that way with, with his character and, and uh, Kiss plays it that way. But the audience wants you to be bigger than life. And they don't, they don't really want to know, you know, where you eat or where you shop or anything like that. They want you to be different. So be as different as you can. But write good songs. You have to write good songs. Sounds simple enough. <laughs> well, you know, too many guys write riffs and beats and forget to write the melody. The reason why songs from the 60s and 70s still work is because there's a lot of melody involved because we listen to the Beatles. And we were, trying to, we were trying to write songs like the Beatles. Ozzy will say the same thing. Anybody from that generation will say, we all listen to the Beatles trying to write a great song. And then you take it and make it hard and heavy. But if it's just a beat and a guitar riff and some guy yelling at you, I mean, I always go, I get it, you're angry. <laughs> but, but be angry with a song, not just a riff. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Um, following up on that, after seeing how um, cultures change just within music and traveling around the world for all these years, are there any instances that have stood out where you've had culture shock? Are there any what? Are there any instances that stand out from your career where you've had culture shock or been felt out of place? Well, you know, you know, anymore you cannot shock an audience. You know, uh, an audience was easy to shock in the 60s and 70s because we proved that. Um, now, I've talked to Marilyn and I've talked to Rob Zombie and we're not as shocking as CNN. But is, as far as you, has there ever been a moment that's caught you off guard or had you feeling out of place during uh, your tours? Or No, there's, you know, there's been moments, awkward moments, where Alice didn't quite fit in, but then Alice shouldn't fit in. I mean, he's not supposed to fit in. But, you know, there's, like I said, it, it's any more, I mean, you could shock an audience if I cut my arm off and ate it. But you could only do it twice. <laughs> you know, you can't do that every night. Uh, and, you know, I, they cut my head off every night. Well, in the 70s, people used to go, oh, God, that's so disgusting and it's awful. Now you turn on CNN, there's a guy really getting his head cut off. So that, to me, is much more shocking than what, what you could do theatrically on stage. Um, somebody probably will commit suicide on stage at some point 20 years from now. And, like, again, you only do it once. But <laughs> hopefully, you know, Bowie said that one time, and I told him, I said, don't say that. You know, don't, don't, don't talk like that. Because I was afraid you'd do it. And uh, now shock is used as theatrical it's 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 done as a device to make you go wow that was cool it used to be everything to make your parents hate me <laughs> and they did <laughs> thank you hi hi i'm chris uh just before i ask my question i just want to say hey thanks as a as a guy born from sao paulo brazil thank you so much for uh. performing there that shit is awesome <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, so my question is, you know, when my one of the strongest memories I have is when my brother handed me a binder full of Iron Maiden, Alice Cooper, White Zombie. And every time I listen to those songs, I think of narrative. It's narrative. It's a story. Yeah. I love it. It's fantastic. And yeah. I just don't really see that in a lot of stuff that I'm listening to nowadays. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's my problem. But what do you think about narrative when it comes to rock and roll? I almost can't write a song without telling a story. It's almost impossible for me to, to write a song without some sort of story and a punchline and a character somewhere, a, a good guy and a bad guy, whatever. 
uh, and albums. I, I took it further than that and made the album an entire story. You know, Welcome to My Nightmare and Alice Goes to Hell and all these different things. Almost every album was conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, there's not a lot of that going on. It probably is going on in metal more than anything else. Because you'll, one of my favorite things is going to like Denmark and seeing the black metal magazines. Because everybody's either the son of the devil or a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going, and then you meet these guys and they go, hi Alice, my mom made you these cookies. You know, <laughs> these, you know, they look like, you know, but it's, it's, it's great theatrics. But they do write these really strange sci-fi kind of mystical things. And they're the only ones who really do that. I find it's really hard to write an album without doing a theme. And I guess out of curiosity, what is your favorite story? Sorry? What is your favorite story to write about? Oh, well, you know, I mean, there were, uh, Welcome to My Nightmare was good because it was about a kid that couldn't wake up out of a nightmare. And his mom is calling him and he just can't wake up. And to me, that was an ongoing nightmare. That, that was, I can't think of anything worse than that, than not being able to wake up out of a nightmare. Um, that probably was the most defined storyline I ever wrote. Uh, Along Came a Spider was the same kind of thing. I was a serial killer. And uh, all through the whole album, you kept, it kept dropping hints of who it was. And at the very end, you're sure it was this guy in the mental hospital, and, he, and he's talking to his pet spider, saying, well, I didn't do it, did you? And he goes, no. And it left it like that. In other words, who did it if it wasn't them? So it was a real, a real mystery kind of thing. And I am going to write part two of that. Gotcha. Well, hey, thank you so much. Eventually. <laughs> I look forward to keep listening. Thank you. Hi, Alice. Hi. So I'm going to ask the one non-music-related question uh, of the day, but from one former cross-country runner to another... Uh, what would be your greatest running story? Oh man, I, I, was, I, I was in a very unique situation. You have to picture this now. I'm 15 years old. Uh, I'm going to Cortez High School. I don't know anybody. And I tried out for the baseball team because I played baseball all my life. I just didn't have a good enough arm to get it in from right field, right? I could hit anything. And this guy named Dennis Dunaway was in my art class. And he says, you know, you weigh 100 pounds, you're probably a good runner. And I went, I, I don't know if I'm a runner or not. In Arizona, you know, 110 degrees out. And he says, you got to try out for cross country. This was way before the band, way before the Beatles. And I went out, tried out, and I, I made varsity in my first, first year. Unfortunately, I would have run, I would have been the number one runner at any other high school. I was the seventh best runner at that school. There were six other guys faster than me in the mile. We were 72 and 0 in cross country. Nobody could even come close to us. In cross, but we couldn't win a football game to save our life. You know, we couldn't win any other sport. Cross country was the least popular sport, and we were unbeatable. Four of those guys on that team ended up being in the Alice Cooper band. <laughs> so the fact that we were jocks, and not just jocks, four-year lettermen, we had to hide that from the rock audience because they thought we were these degenerates that lived, you know, <laughs> mom and dad was a hell's angel and all this, you know. And we were like, you know, these jocks. And, but we were all also art students. And that's really where the Alice Cooper thing came in. We, we heard the Beatles for the first time, said, oh, we got to do a band, put a band together. And it was immediately theatrical. It all of a sudden was theatrical. But we were still running. After school, you know, we'd be running in these races, and in high school, we were the biggest band in Phoenix. We were the Spiders. And these guys would look at us go, aren't you guys the guys in that band? You know, yeah, yeah. You know, so we were both state champions and <laughs> Spiders at the same time. It was a dichotomy that, that, that still is pretty weird. And that's the first time anyone's ever called a cross-country runner a jock. That's right. Well, we were jocks. Yeah, we were jocks. I still have my, I still have my letter sweater. Hi, uh, I'm Zach. Uh, what was it like doing the Sgt. Pepper's movie? You know, I, I went, remember when Blockbuster was open? 
Everybody, everybody rented videos from Blockbuster. They had a special section called The Great Turkeys of All Time. I'm in three of them. I was in Monster Dog. I was in Sgt. Pepper. And I was in Sextet with Mae West and Keith Moon and Ringo and a bunch of people. All three movies sucked. Just sucked. Uh, Monster Dog was a movie that I would rent. Because I rent C movies. I love C movies. Uh, but, you know, it was like I just got out of rehab and I, I said, I've got to find a movie or I've got to do something to prove that I can work without alcohol. So I took this movie in Spain called Monster Dog. <laughs> and they said, well, don't worry, it'll only be released in the Philippines. <laughs> well, of course, they're re-releasing it now, you know. So, uh, unfortunately, you'll be seeing that. Uh, <laughs> And the worst thing is turning on HBO late at night and it's on, you go, oh my gosh, here we go. You know. But uh, Sextet was Mae West, 86 years old, and I, it was myself, uh, Timothy Dalton, uh, Ringo, uh, Keith Moon, all of these guys. She came on to us, every guy in that movie, at 86 years old. We'd get done with the scene and she'd go, why don't you come on back to my trailer? I said, because you're 86, you know? And I'm not sure if you're a woman. <laughs> and she'd say, oh, I'm all woman. And then Ringo would tell me, he'd say, hey, she came on to me. And I said, yeah, me too. And everybody raises their hand. So she was great. She was great. You know, but the movie sucked. I mean, I played an Italian singing waiter. But it was fun. Sergeant Pepper. You don't do Sergeant Pepper without the Beatles. You know, it's just one of those things... The Bee Gees were so big right then that they decided the Beatles didn't want to do it, so the Bee Gees were going to do it. Well, right then, you've just lost every Beatle fan in the world. And they filled it up with, you know, Peter Frampton and myself and Steve Martin and Aerosmith and all these people. And it was a good idea. It just didn't work at all. But if you watch it, you know, if you watch it with the right frame of mind, it's funny. Thank you. So is this Monster Dog movie as obvious as it sounds? Monster Dog, actually, I play a character who is going back to his house in, you know, wherever it is, and somehow there's like 50 dogs. And at the end, the dog bites me, and I turn into this horrible dog. Oh. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the, the great thing about this movie was this. Everybody in the cast was British or American in Spain. When we got the movie back, they had overdubbed our voices in a broken English. So I'm driving along in the car, and the very first thing I say is, hey, where are we going tomorrow? I went, what? <laughs> I said, that's not my voice. Everybody, they overdubbed everybody's voice in broken English. And I kind of thought that made it even more interesting, the fact that they, we didn't speak good enough broken English for them, you know. What's your name? Do you want to tilt down the microphone a little bit? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Hey, I'm Seth, and my question is, what made you, what made you want to make Schools Out? Well, if you could capture, if you're going to write an anthem, if you could capture the last three minutes of the last day of school before vacation, think of that. It's, you have two and a half months off, and you're looking at the clock, and the teacher's talking, and you only have three more minutes left until you have, you're off for... I said, if we can capture that on a song, it's going to... It, every kid will totally relate to it. And so at the very end of that song, you hear all the kids cheering and everything like that. Uh, we, find, we got that. It's, it, that song sounds like it's uh, anarchy, but it's actually a very joyous song because every kid that hears it goes, yes! You know... And it's still, to this day, they play it in every school on the last day of school. I'm the Francis Scott Key of school, you know. So. Hi, I'm Hannah. I was curious if you have a specific moment in the show that you look forward to every night, either performing it yourself or watching somebody else. I think it might be strangling my wife. It's, no. 
It's, we, my, Cheryl and I kill each other on stage twice, and we never argue. It's the greatest thing in the world. Every, everybody married here, you know, go through some sort of practice, you pretend like you're killing each other, and it's great. But you get on stage, and what happens, I'm in a straight jacket, right? And she's the nurse, the thing. And when she's over here, I break out of the straight jacket, Right? And while I'm strangling her, she takes out these two knives and stabs me. And then she puts me in the guillotine and I get my head cut off. I like that part. Thank and you. It's, yeah, it's uh, very therapeutic. It's very therapeutic. <laughs> I recommend it to everybody here for your, for your marriage therapy. Uh, and for some reason, it's the hardest part is not laughing. But on stage that night, we, we, we play it really serious. I mean, I really look like I'm just can't wait to strangle her and when she pulls the knives out she looks at the audience and shh, you know it's i think there's some amount of reality in it you know <laughs> but we never argue it's great after the show i go great show great stab go. tonight she goes yeah great joke thank you <laughs> all right so we only have about five minutes left so we have a couple more questions here I'm sad. I just want to know, what was your favorite golf course to play that you ever played on? I think probably Muirfield in Canton, Ohio uh, is a really great course. I play, I play one in Maui that, that I like really a lot called McKenna, too. But, you know, golf is, is so anti-rock, and now every band plays. I was the pioneer of bringing... I, and people say, why do you play golf? And I go, I say, I'm just trying to make the game more violent. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adam. Hey. Uh, so being in an up and coming rock band myself, um, actually I think we played the Carolina Rebellion that you played that cool. year. Um, and I think you hit on this earlier. Uh, what advice would you have for an up and coming rock band besides like sharpening their teeth and being a little different? Well, you know, I mean the whole thing about being on stage is the energy involved. Uh, uh, the, what makes music rock is the attitude and the energy and the image. Um, we've lost a little bit of image, whereas a lot of bands right now want to look like everybody else. Whereas, I mean, look at the bands from the 70s. If it was the Rolling Stones, you knew it was the Rolling Stones. If it was Motley Crue, you knew it was Motley Crue. You knew if it was Alice Cooper. You knew if it was Bon Jovi. You knew if it was... Those bands all had image. I think that's something that's lacking right now. Bands don't have image. They're afraid to do image. Uh, Black Veil Brides were the last band that had image, you know. Um, but that's something to, to, to try to find in the band. Who are you? What should you look like? And stick with it so that bands, so they can identify with it. They can look at the band and go, oh, yeah, that's, you know, whatever your, the name of your band is. But find something that, that is yours that's only you, that, that when they look at you, they, they, well, that could only be, what's the name of your band? Something Clever. Oh, well. well, that's something clever, you know. <laughs> so be clever. Be more clever than anybody, you know. No, but I mean, find something that's only you. Devo. When you saw Devo, you knew it was Devo. There was no two ways about that. Uh, I don't find that a lot anymore. I, I find that everybody wants to fit in, and, and I just don't understand that. Uh, don't fit in. Thank you. So, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. So, is there any final thoughts that you want to let us know? You know, I'll see you guys in... Uh, we got two... Uh, Vampires have got a live album coming out and, and a studio album. All new material, all original material. No covers on this one. I think Johnny might sing Heroes from Bowie. That might be the only cover. And... Um, my album's coming out, my new album's coming out, and my new live album's coming out. So there's four albums coming out. It's a lot of hours. Yeah. We'll take it all.